Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here to such a competent and strategic audience for my films. Um, flatter, flatter. Um, but, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about, about where the movie is located in terms of its history. Very little bit because the whole idea of making movies was born out of, you know, superseding the academic talk as a mayor of presentation towards, pro to, towards an engagement which is sensorial and relational and direct, okay? Um, I'm telling you a little bit about the project that encompasses these films. It's called uh, uh, Sexual Humanitarianism, understanding, uh, uh, you know, um, it's basically trying to understand the way in which particular groups, a particular category are constructed by humanitarian discourses and the way these discourses become bordering devices because in order to pass the border you need to produce some kind of self-presentation of yourself which is also a regime of subjectification because as you know in order to be believed you, you need to believe it yourself. So we are focusing on the way in which um, you know, narratives of sexuality and gender are becoming like, you know, following the debate on homonationalism, like the epitome of Westernness and a Western superiority on, on everything else. Um, we decided then to, to call this particular brand of humanitarian bordering sexual humanitarianism because of that. And we focused on two humanitarian tropes, if you want, and figures. Uh, or, or rhetorical figures. One is the gay asylum seeker and one is the victim of trafficking, both of which are uh, humanitarian repertoires that correspond to a version of reality, but as you know, uh, or, uh, you know they, they don't uh, you know, coincide with it. In order to uh, pass the border and in order to be accepted as a refugee, you need to tell a particular version of yourself that corresponds to the Geneva Convention. And in France, uh, uh, Algerian transsexuals are, um, have been granted the status of social group according to the Geneva Convention. This is very important because this is means that because you can only receive asylum according to an inalienable understanding and, 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 and characteristic of yourself and to a specific social experience, it means that this particular group you know, has been identified as particularly vulnerable, but also as a gateway. It is also becoming a gateway for people to smuggle themselves through, and I use smuggling as a positive action, of course, you know, the border. Okay, so Samira is a film about this, is a film about an Algerian, uh, um, as he calls himself, transsexual, which uh, I rightly, I understand after your presentation, actually describe as transgender. Uh, because uh, he is uh, navigating very different regimes of sexualization and subjectivation according to sexuality from Algeria to France and back, as you'll see. Um, it is the method of ethnofiction, the last thing I'm going to say that I use queers, if you want, uh, Jean Rouche's tradition of ethnofiction. Jean Rouche is one of the founding fathers of visual anthropologies who asks the same to play the same. So in Abidjan, back in the 60s, he asked the young migrants from N Niger into uh, Cote d'Ivoire to talk collectively about their own stories. But the kind of uh, truthfulness in his film was based on consubstantiality, if you want. So the same represented the same, although it was not his own or her own story. In my case, the problem is that I'm talking to people who are stigmatized multiply because they are sex worker, because they are queer, because they are transgender, and because we got no papers. So how do you put a camera in front of somebody like that and tell them to be real? How is that gaze deforming or fair? So I decided that my method, the only way following Rouge, who uses a very unfortunate penetrative me metaphor, he says like the only fiction can penetrate reality. I don't think penetration is, is the best way to, to understand <laughs> reality necessarily, but that's his words, not mine, okay? So what I'm trying to do here is to use fiction to stage two things, like the kind of ethnographic moment, so ethnographic representation, in other ways, how I met this person and how I did not meet this person, so I only show you what I also could and couldn't do, right? Through, by using actors, okay? So the person you're gonna see is an actor. And what I claim with my film is that they're not real, of course, I'm not bonkers, I hope, but I, uh, they are socio-anthropologically true, okay? This is the kind of claim I make. And it is, of course, an artistic and political uh, device following Ranciere that I have invented because I think that representations constitute the epistemological field of knowledge in which we are, fictional that is, and that I think as academics we have a responsibility to also, you know, immerse our findings into that kind of wider regime of representations. Because films like Lilia Forever, for example, which is a film 
a fiction film about uh, you know uh, a Natasha story, which is the classical. You know, I don't want to be derisory here. I mean, these things happen, okay? But it's like kind of naive woman from Russia who gets trafficked into Sweden, and and then you know she's naive and and the, the pimp is beautiful, and then she gets the papers. It's used in court. It's being used in court. So I just think that it is part of also a, a responsibility as, as scholars to, to try and, and, and mess and, and with this. Okay, enough said. I'll leave you in company with Samira. It's about 27 minutes. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions afterwards because um, I think it, she's going to be interesting for you. You're very welcome. That's really, really fascinating. Thank you. So, so you said at the beginning um, in your introduction that that the lactose. So is that inactive or ethnographic research? So was was the dialogue the dialogue that we had with the participants? Yeah. Exactly. It was I don't know about exactly because the, it needs to be realistic, the kind of uh, acting. And so if, if you impose people a verbatim performance, you'll see that the, their eyes look back into memory all the time. They're not there with you. So it was improvisation, but on a very, very close, as close as possible to the real scenes. So that's the scenes you see with me in the flat and me in the streets are, are scenes that I have witnessed. Yeah, the others, because Samira is both somebody, it's like say 80% somebody and I met, and then the other, the, and 80% say what I witnessed, and the rest I took from other stories yeah, of people belonging to the same group. So it is some kind of socio-anthropological modeling. Yeah, it's not, but when I actually checked with her, for example, with me, because I met her in the street, which, and she was in heroic, seductive mode, she did not talk about, about um, vulnerability. She didn't want to talk about vulnerability because then she had to have sex, she had to be glamorous and everything. But then when I checked with her whether the asylum story I attached to her, you know, was coherent, she said, yes, that's the kind of story I come from, you know, which is a humanitarian story because the father who is a Muslim, like integralist, and then the, the son who is a policeman gives you the perfect combination for you to be persecutable at home under a social and systemic institutional Way so everybody say that because that way you know you can only stay in France. It's amazing. So it's very easy to focus on the, uh, the vulnerability of Samira, but I found you quite vulnerable as well in this film. Did you feel vulnerable in kind of filming in practice? Like that? Uh, I felt frustrated really because because she I was um, I was at uh, at her mercy. Well, as an anthropo not as a person, but as as a researcher, yes, because she called all the shots, and uh, and and you know, and so it should it be, but in in other case, because she manifested herself like at night in front of her flat, very very different hours, so I had to just you know cross my fingers and hope she was there, and then sometimes she would she would just tell me you can gotta work, you know, blah blah blah, and I really was fascinated with her. I really wanted to to tell her story. So yeah, I felt a bit like that. I felt a bit like um, fragile. And in, and in a way, what I wanted to show this is also an ethnography of failure. It's also what I couldn't see. And I want to show also the limits of that, because, you know, God knows how many other facets there are. That's what the film was going to show, actually. The complexity of her identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm French Tunisian, so I could totally relate and understand yeah. everything that was going on. And there's so many the intersectionality and there's what you see and what you don't see kind of thing and all the different kind of sort of like social constructs and images and morphs that you try to fit into. Like, you know, you're a good Muslim during Ramadan so you don't drink and you don't um, yeah. perform Sin. sexual acts mm. and that enables you to identify as a Muslim for that month. And then the rest of the time and then the fact that she's prostituting herself and then she's married to a woman. I mean, the whole, the, the entire thing is just fascinating. And, how it, and, and for me, what came across is how many lies were going on. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? There were quite a few lies that she has to, like she's lying to her family or his family or their family. I don't yeah. know how they identify themselves. But, you know, when, they, when um, Samira was on the telephone with her family, I was like, yeah, everything's fine, you know, no problem. Yeah. Kind of thing. And, and 
it wasn't a reflection of the reality. So the impact it has can be mm. quite self-destructive, I think. Um, I, I think, yeah, that, that's, that's a part of her. Yeah, the double life, which is not, you know, it, it is intrinsic to, to, to selling sex, you know, and like people who sell sex normally need to have a double life in order to have the respect of people who love them and, and who they love. For me, it was more than double. I could see at least four different lives with her. But, but I think what, what you see here is multiple truths, really, okay. because uh, when she's telling the truth all the time, you know, she's telling the humanitarian truth, which is her own truth as well. It's a version of her. So in a way, in a way it, this is an exercise on the, on the constructiveness of subjectivity. We don't get any more real than that. It just is a very exploded version, if you want, because she is coming from territories um, and moral territories that are in very big contradiction. So uh, this kind of tension is exploded, but I don't think you need to be Muslim or, or diasporic in order to negotiate your, your morality in this particular way and, 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 and be a bit more kind of, you know, have your rituals and then, and, and then transgress them and negotiate spirituality like that. You know, that is a very kind of, you know, it's not only her, but at the same time, what she's coming from a very Mediterranean classic kind of binary system of sexual identification, mm. which pre-exists the Foucaultian confessional one, which is I am active, therefore I penetrate, therefore I'm a man, everything else is a non-man, and, and, and if you're not married, then you are a whore or a queer. That's it. And, and she, she gives you that. And in a way, she's, she's in between different systems of representation, and it's very confusing, but to her it all makes sense, you know? And, and but, but many times, like if, if you know the old style queens back in the fifties, they would say, "I'm not sleeping with other gay people. I'm not lesbian." That's exactly what she's saying. So there's nothing extraordinary about that. It's just before my generation, in which you know the real man was something that you wanted to have sex with because everybody else was a bunch of of women and you didn't want to have sex with them. That was the kind of so in a way, it's a ver it's it's a transnational version of that. Just following on from that, I think she she seems to be leading multiple. Mm -hmm. in terms of self-presentation. But some psychologists might argue that what we see here is denial, denial of sexual identity. I'm just wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit on that. Did you detect denial there, or is it? Very, very tricky. Because with me, some, there was a we sometimes. There was a we that emerged because I, I, I wanted to be friends with her, besides the, the, the instrumentality of, of establishing anthropological rapport. I really liked her, and she was lots of fun. She was very humorous all the time and stuff like that. And so there was a way in which sometimes she talked to about us being discriminated and us having it difficult, as gay people. <laughs> yeah, and, and no problem for me, you know. And then, but then there were moments in which there was also an aspect of class which intersects with the coloniality of it. Because when she calls me French, what she's saying is I'm middle class. You don't understand. Like, I'm, I, as well as coming from a different background, she said, yeah, 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 poor thing, you know. Your mom accepted you, your father accepted you. That's not my story. She says, don't you try it. And she's right. You know, there's no, it's incommensurable, the level of rejection and... and and their working class, which is when she says also that the family of Samira, you know, they're French. For her, French means also middle class and people who can be gay and accept. And she's very ambivalent because, you know, she, she owns it, but then she also internalizes the stigma and she calls the other prostitutes, fat, you know, whores and queers. This is like... It, it's all in and out with her, and, and it was interesting because one night it was Gay Pride and there was this kind of RuPaul kind of style drag queen because she used to sell sex at the corner where the main gay club in, uh, you know, in, in Marseille is, and there was a historical moment you know, in which this drag queen met Samira and they looked at each other in the eye and, and the drag queen went right to the club and she said, I bet she thought we were the same, but we are not. And I said, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know. But she, you know, it was, she, she came from a very different background. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, this was an art. Actually, I forgot the, the, the elephant in the, in the room is that this was an art installation, okay, which was on two separate screens, each of the side of this screen, okay, on the floor uh, at an inclination angle of 120 degrees, okay. 
So, and it was in a loop. So it begins with a car sound and it ends with a car sound. So I tried to reproduce the a flat version of this, but this is, you see this, the film is full on two screens all the time because the way in which it was supposed to work is that you sit in and then you're, uh, you can only look at one screen or the other. You cannot look at, so something needs to be going on. And also the mode of fruition was that you walk to a gallery, you think this is too long and then you walk out, but something she says makes you go back and everybody went back. I was very pleased, I was following them in, the, in their gallery at the beginning. <laughs> and I was, at the beginning I said, oh shit, they are going away, but then then they went back and then they sat down and then they were, you know, the people were, were, were thinking about it and watching it several times because it's a bit complicated, all this. So I had that in mind for, at the beginning, for an audience of people who are artists and academics working on borders because it was produced by a project called the Anti-Atlas of Borders. And this was the section of embodied humanitarian borders, okay? And it has been seen in different um, contexts. The artistic context is very interesting, needs no explanation. Like, they get it straight away. In the academic content as well, when you, when, when you then go to uh, film festivals or a document, uh, to a documentary film festival, they don't understand what to do with it because they don't understand what this is. Right? I not be, I'm not being patronizing by saying they don't understand, but it is not the kind of thing that is easily replaceable because it looks real, so if not, it's not even experimental because usually experimental documentary don't look like this. This looks like a real film, but it is an experimental documentary that plays with a naturalist kind of aesthetic. So yeah, it, it, it is received differently in different places, but um, you know, I mean, in, in general, its best, its best place is, it, is in this kind of space between research and art. Yeah, that's... Ah, uh, yeah. They would, uh, they would, um, it has been shown at a transgender film festival, like in Amsterdam, Transcreen, it has been accepted there, I was very proud of it, and in Italy as well, at the equivalent in Bologna. So that is obviously something that, you know, is interesting for, for people. Um, human rights is very tricky. I think they, I, I haven't been asked yet, but I'm trying not to be again, but you know, it doesn't really comfort a homogeneous humanitarian history, does it? You know, in a way, this is the story of, oh, it could be read, because cause credibility is in the eyes of the beholder. If you're racist or something like this, could, this could be read as a bogus asylum seeker. It has been read like that by some people in France, for example, who said, so in a way she's faking it, and that's not what I wanted to show. I wanted to show that all these versions are real, right? Because she's saying, you know, I, w I told them what they wanted to say. If, I go if I'm going to apply for a job and say, actually, you know, I'm not very much of an anthropologist, I'm more of a sociologist, and the job is anthropology, do I think I'm going to get it? So she's doing the same thing. She's doing the same thing. At the opera, she, she plays, but it, so it really depends on, on the framework, I haven't been asked so much to show this one by, by, by human rights, um, um, uh, you know, uh, organizations. But the previous film I made, which was more about trafficking and sexual exploitation, has been owned up by sex work movement, for example, and, 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 and by NGOs of a humanitarian nature that wanted to open up the box of victimhood. So maybe it's a bit early, I don't know. You wanted to ask a question. Mm. my impression of these uh, two frames yeah. and rather than using, using this typical Hollywood shot and over the shoulder shot yeah. thing to, to construct the conversation. So my question was really what was the intention to use that cinematic device? Right, uh, to, uh, multiple. The, um, some I wanted to, to, to spatialize and visualize the, the positions um, of the observed and the ob observee in different ways, so there is the ethnographic gaze. I've never seen many, I don't see many films in which that gaze is represented, and yet it's, it's something that we all live, you know, all the time. And so there is my gaze towards her and, 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 and back, right? And then there is the, the institutional gaze, and then there is the medical gaze, and, uh, and then there is the more intimate gaze, which is when we, we are at, at the flat. So 
the level of inclination of our faces and the level of in, in, in mergeability of the two screens reflects a bit of that. So when I'm on, on field work sometimes and, I, and I, I go over to see her to look at her scars, right? And that, I wanted to, to do that because it happened, and, but also because I wanted to go to, on the other side to, to, to show how, how intrusive research is in a way. Because in a way, I'm staring at her for, for all, all the time and, and I am, I'm saying, oh, I'm getting this and that, so that she can talk. She didn't need an encouragement, but you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was also a way of doing it. I wanted to, to stage that. At the, off, at the home office, it's profile to profile. And it kills a bit the kind of expressiveness be because I wanted to just, uh, in a way, show you know the kind of power relation. At the doctor, it's a bit more messy because the doc, the, the medical, especially in kind of harm reduction, you know, frontline services, it's a very skillful, very empathetic kind of kind of you know approach. It's like when you go to, a, to, to an HIV and AIDS clinic, you know, it looks like a very normal conversation but there is an epidemiological kind of checklist being <laughs> given to you, but it looks like, oh, okay, so you know, I've got a pain in your testicle and this and that. So that, so yeah, I tried to do that. Tried to, to just find a filmic, or, you know, a filmic kind of parallel to, to these dynamics. And I wanted to say one thing about, about intimacy, because we said about intimacy before and sexuality. I think the most intimate moment between us is when she shows me the passport. Because I think we assume that intimacy is in sex, but I think intimacy is a lot on in survival and in what, in what makes you yourself and what, and what you depend on. And when she showed me her cards, that's when I was friends with her. Because it, it really, that's where she was at risk. You know, she couldn't sleep because of her papers. And when the, the one night she called me, this is the real person, she called me in the middle of, of, uh, of August because uh, her friend sent her like, this kind of disparaging, um, you know, postcard and she was really upset and she just brought me to her place and she said look at my papers what can we do can we help me but I thought that when she showed me the papers that was when we were closest not when she showed me you know her breasts or like when we were talking about sex or anything I just wanted to offer this as a reflection of the location of, of, of the intimate when you talk about migration following on to what Francesca said before about you know, the way in which, yes, we are studying sexuality and migration, but because I come to sexuality as a migration scholar, it is very important to put migration as a process at the center of it. In other ways, you, you know, look at Samira. She wants to become the son that her father wanted to, and her mother wanted to become by migrating. And look what a journey she has in doing that. You know, there is, yes, a very strong, um, you know, sexual uh, component, but it is also about the son or, the, you know, who, comes home full of goods to his family. This is the classic of migration studies. This is what people migrate for, to achieve social mobility. Then there is, you know, then there is the sexual aspect of it, but, but first and foremost, people want a better life, you know? And sometimes it is the sexual aspect that they are frustrated for, but it's always something in between. And the economic and the documentation is very important. Yeah. Yes, now, this is a, 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 it's a very good question. She has seen the film, but you know, I was there all, I, I always laugh about this because we have our own fan fantasy of restitution and reciprocity and all of these ethical, beautiful things that we write in applications, right? Which is great and honorable, but you know what she said? After I spent two years salivating over our ethnographic encounter and then like, you know, trying to do this, she said like, I'm really, I think it's great, I look beautiful in the film. <laughs> I was really worried you were going to find a, an ugly actress. <laughs> He's gorgeous. Thanks. Yes, it, and they say, yes, yes, it's like me. It's, this is my story. Um, can I have a copy? OK, that's it. So <laughs> you know, I had more interesting, you know, after two years of work, she's been my muse for two years. I would have expected some kind of ideal. I don't know. Yeah, in my, my head, we were going to sit together. I, I think it is, and it's a real one, but in my head we were going to sit together and watch it scene by scene, but I also, I, I also think that it is very embarrassing to, be, to see people portraying you like that. Because I started, this, I was very frustrated about this, and I'm laughing about it now, but I was quite frustrated, and I was thinking, my God, you know, is there any point in this and that? And, and then I thought, what about if somebody made a film about me, using an actor, you know, and, and expose my, my kind of frailty and bullshitness and all my fragmentation and then come on, come and watch it and say, I wouldn't go. 
<laughs> so I would probably limit, I'd probably even say, yeah, nice, bye, you know, freak. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.